All right. We have Dice Addict Jalen in the Pickle Dragon. And we're here to talk about the Monstrous Lexicon, the newest release from a collaboration between the Pickle Dragon and Kelsey at the Arcane Library. So before we do that, though, I wanted to mention that in just two days, on December 31st, we're having a giveaway to celebrate the release of the Monstrous Lexicon of this big old Kraken. And why a Kraken, you may ask? It's because there are two Leviathans inside of this book, two monsters. Uh, this is the Saltwater Leviathan. And there's also a freshwater variety that's smaller with a smaller CR. But uh, to enter this contest, all you have to do is go to www.thepickledragon.com and subscribe there. And don't forget to verify your email because otherwise the subscription does not hold. So, to enter, all you do is subscribe. And then you're also entered in all future Pickled Dragon giveaways. So it's quite a deal. Release the Kraken, or Leviathan in this case. All right, so on with the book. So this is a book, like I said, that's a collaboration between the Arcane Library and I. The It started at Gary Con, which you didn't go to. You didn't come with to Gary Con. Nope. No. No. All, right. All right, well, in any case, Kelsey and I met there, um, and we had actually been speaking before that, but we were sitting at a table in the open gaming area, and we thought, how fun would it be to write our own monster manual, but only of goofy monsters, like toilet mimics, and booze oozes, and stuff like that, just goofy monsters, right? Well, we resolved to make a monster manual, but it turned out to be a more serious endeavor, and that's what came, that's how the the monstrous lexicon had its roots, it's, a, it's kind of a joke monster thing, but we eventually decided to make a bunch of serious monsters. Like serious, like a heart attack. So, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Unscripted, as always. Pickle Dragon. We don't believe in writing scripts. It just lets, whatever happens may happen. So, yeah. Right, Jalen. Dysatic Jalen. Cameraman Hagmar is not with us today. He thought it was better to go off and go off and play some games instead of uh, help us out here. But we'll forgive him and his games. Okay, so anyway, so the Monsters Lexicon not only includes nearly 70 new monsters, but also four, four, well, that's eight, four playable races, right? We've got the Gruleshi, which are a race of, like, elephant men, only there's a twist to them because they're very spiritual, and as they rise in enlightenment, they actually grow additional trunks, and they can use their their spirituality and their enlightenment to tune to magic, or not to magical, but precious stones that they mount in their foreheads. And most of their uh, racial abilities comes from which stone they choose to mount in their forehead and attune to the can spiritual they, means. Can they attune to many stones or only one? Only one. But as you go up in levels, you have more options available to you. So are you allowed to like, so you can like trade out stones? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can trade them out. It's pretty cool. So that's the Gruleshi. Next, we have the Grugach. Now the Grugach, they came from the idea of... Now if you if you played any second edition or third edition, you'll probably recognize the Grugach as wild elves. But the original... The original uh, myth had them as like little chubby gnomes and whatnot. So I decided to resurrect the Grugach as it was intended. Only rather than the gnomes that we have that are like tinkerers and, um, you know, illusionists and so forth. These are fully embraced nature. So they've cast off all forms of, of technology and embrace nature. So a lot of their racial abilities revolve around the fact that they can have like a little spirit animal and um, they can speak with animals once per day and that sort of thing. 
And, and as they go up in levels, they actually get a couple other things. So that that is the Grugach, which I really like. Next up, we have the Minotaur. Now, I don't think the Minotaur really need any introduction, but we actually did two sub races of Minotaur. We've got the Apiran Minotaur, which are surface dwelling, beer drinking, hard living, battle loving, glory seeking, boisterous. That's you, yes. Okay. Boisterous, loudmouth Minotaur. Like, like a pro wrestler on steroids, which I guess maybe is. I mean that's maybe that's redundant, but in any case, they love life and they live life to the fullest. But there's a second sub race, the deep minotaurs, which living in the dark, the deep dark, you know, takes a little bit of subtlety or a lot of subtlety and secrecy that the appear in the surface minotaurs just don't have. But the deep minotaurs are very secretive, very cunning, and completely unlike their surface dwelling brothers cousins brothers whichever all right next we have Jalen's favorite yes what do we got what are they the lupine why do you love the lupine because I, I like them a lot do several reasons one because of their duty and devotion to like very honorable they're very honorable very honorable they're the devotion to the pack yes their devotion to remaining free. Someone once asked me if they were like, because they have this, they have the, the, the way of the pact, which is their, their, um, kind of the creed that they live by. And they are a very lawful and organized society, but they also embrace what's called forever wild, which is the idea that all of the decisions they make are to keep the pack free and, out of the control of other races. So someone asked me, well, did you make a chaotic lawful race? Because you know, and I'm like, no, because it's it's an individual, uh, each member of the pack has its place. And it's not that they have a caste system, but the way they approach life and the way they um, construct their society it's a very organized and rigid way of living, but it's all to ensure f the freedom of their people. So a lot of people associate being wild or free with chaos, but that's not necessarily true. Um, but I like them a lot because, you know, cat lovers have tabaxis, and I'm a dog lover, so I had to have the lupine. I love them. They, and the Lupine and Minotaur and Gruleshi actually appear as both a playable race in the Monsters Lexicon and a monster. So there are monster entries with little special things and extra information about their, their race. But uh, now we're going to get to the meat of it. Now we're going to get to the meat of the, the book, the monsters. Now, <clears throat> the monsters... First, let me start by saying we had a kind of an idea... Kelsey and I had an idea of what could we bring that's a little different to that really hasn't been done much in monster manuals. Um, so each and every monster, each and every monster is much more than just a bunch of stats you could throw at a, at a player. So for example, we do have a giant. The giant is called the uh, Gog Magog. And if you look at the monster manual or any other source, Giants are basically a big giant weapon and throwing a rock at somebody. Well, our giant has the ability to punt people across the battlefield, grab them and throw them at another player character, and pick up another player and just crush them as hard as they can. You know, stuff like that. Uh, so it's it's there's much more of a dynamic battlefield with the Gog Magog, and we try to apply that th that that um, we try to apply that to all of the monsters. They all have something a little different, a little a little twist that's going to surprise any table. Like, holy crap, that just happened. Um, but from a story standpoint, we also tried to write a very in-depth background for each monster. And part of that is that the book is written by two retired adventurers. We got Borg here, who is a human, 
quite old and fat and gray and grizzled and, and ready for his time in this world to be over. And then we have his elven companion, Rin, who just can't bear to see Borg move on. And even though he's like, man, this life has taken forever to end, she just can't bear to let him go, so she keeps slipping potions of longevity to him when he's not looking. That's really funny. Yeah. But, funny. but they've come together to write this book. All of the creatures they learned of during their adventures, all of the creatures that they battled, some of them that they cooperated with. They're not all evil, uh, and they're certainly not all good. But they all have a little something special. So, so prior to each and every monster, you you could have a little dialogue from either Rin or Borg or both, where they talk about this monster. So, what's your favorite, Jalen? What was your favorite little blurb from the two adventurers? My favorite was when they were talking about the puck wedgie. The puck wedgie. And Borg, he was like, more than anything, I want to stop that little face teeth down his throat. Someday he will get what's coming to him. So Borg, so a puck wedgie is like a little fey creature, like a sprite or a, a pixie. But here you want to show him the picture. It's kind of folded up. But but they're, mis they're mischievous, definitely neutral evil. Um, and if you ever manage to, if you ever manage to insult one of them they go out of their way they use their illusionary powers to lead you astray in the wild typically to a very dangerous monster's lair on accident but in any case the uh the puck wedgie is is just one of those creatures that just lives to make your life miserable as are many of these creatures sounds like my sister so this is this is my actually this is my favorite blurb of the two for the packed devil. Get your get your characters, your player characters to sell their souls. We'll come back to him in a minute, but this is their little this is their little blurb. So Rin says, the trick is to promise your soul to two of them and watch them work it out between them. And then Borg says, I find the trick is to get them to stand still long enough to bury your axe into their head. But in any case. The, the, the pack devil. We'll come back to him in a minute. But the Monsters Lexicon has a, a number of monsters, all ranging from CR0 all the way to CR30. So we have three epic level monsters. Typhon, father of monsters, who's from Greek mythology. He's a big nasty. Gotta love Greek. Gotta love Greek mythology. Cerberus, another from Greek mythology, the three-headed dog. He is in here, as well our a lower CR. Like, obviously, CR 24, you're not going to get a lot of use out of that. So we have the spawn of Cerberus, which Cerberus gets busy with hellhounds, creates the spawn of Cerberus. Those are only CR 5, so you can have three-headed dogs breathe fire and do crazy stuff in your campaign if you wish. So... <clears throat> And then there's another one called the Scaffion, which I'm not going to give too much away about, but it's genius. That one was written by, by Kelsey. It's great. Um, so, yes. let's move on. Jalen. Yes. Monster that you would least like to be eaten by. I feel like you already know. Right. Oh, the Joro. Now the Joro comes... The Joro comes from Japanese mythology, and in Japanese mythology, the Joro is much like a drider, but it can shapeshift between a beautiful woman and a spider, so it's kind of like a drider. But we took it in a new direction. We created this horrific-looking aberrant creature with all these tentacles on him. Only two of the tentacles have these hooks that come out of the pads of the tentacles, and they... Joro will, is an ambush predator. It's going to leap out of the dark, bite someone, try to poison them. And when they're poisoned, they're incapacitated. Then it attaches these hooks to their spinal column and the brace of their brain. And it allows the Joro to control the victim, much like a big meat puppet. And use that person then to lure more prey. Woohoo, help me, I'm in trouble. You know, that sort of thing. 
And after it's collected enough food, it hauls it off and enjoys the fruits of its ventures. Uh, but here's the thing, it loves to eat things while they still are alive. And the poison, the poison subdues them, the hooks that go into them permanently paralyzes them. So the one thing about the Joro, it's big, it's fearsome, but it's a complete coward. So imagine it jumping out of the dark from maybe from a ceiling or a wall, grabbing a player character, yanking him back up into the darkness and trying to run off with him. Best case scenario for the Joro is he's paralyzed from poison. And he's able to just scamper away. What's the party to do? You know, it's not a stand-up fight. You know, or you walk along and you meet someone like, it's, it's Dice Attic Jalen and she's sitting on the ground. She appears wounded. You rush to her side and suddenly from the ceiling drops the big Joro who's been using her as a meat puppet to lure people in. No, that's really not true, because there's no way I would let someone help me with mouse injury. Oh, I see. I got you, so, yeah. If you see me injured, asking for help, it's not me. Okay, we know then. If you see Dice Attic Jalen, it's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. Okay, well, all right. So, that's the, the one she would least like to be eaten by. What is your favorite monster out of the group? My favorite monster? Yes. Well, I have... I have one I really like, and then I have one I feel really bad for. But here's the one I like a lot. The Hamingja. Yes. Oh, no. Okay, so if you played a lot of first and second and third, even third edition, you know that the creature, the divine entities that dwell in the heavens, the seven heavens in Elysium, they tend to allow mortals to solve their own problems for them. You know, that orc horde is coming down to destroy this city and kill every living person in it. Well, that's for the mortals to deal with. The, the, the angels of heaven, they deal with problems like demons and devils and the blood war. Well, the Heminjga is comes from Scandinavian folklore. It's a guardian angel. And they are chaotic good angels who simply will not except that they can stand by and do nothing to help these people. And so they break the covenant that is the relationship set bound by the, the divine beings, the gods, and willingly accept banishment from heavens to go to the material plane and fight alongside mortals. So that is the Hamingga, the guardian angel. Um, she's got... I have another one that I actually really like. Oh, dear. Let's see. Let's see. So she's one kind of fallen angel, but there is another one that she likes here, the, the, hives. the Hive Demons. Okay, so the Hive Demons were inspired by Ridley Scott and James Cameron's co combination of their interpretation of alien and aliens. So we've got a queen that lays eggs. From the eggs hatches a hatchling. Um, now, it's not a face hugger, so let's get that out of the way. It's like a little fleshy-looking spider thing that has a proboscis that can inject larva. And one of the larva wins a race to the brain and taps into the hive mind that is the hive demons. And the rest of the larva migrate to the mouth. And this individual who's now gestating this, this hive demon in its head becomes a host that can run around and bite other people and transfer more larva and create more hive demons. And what hatches forth is typically a drone or a soldier and a, on a very rare occasion, a queen. But the hive demons, um, they're one that we play tested quite a lot. In fact, Joe Manganella, when I ran a game at his house, this was one creature we ran. And, uh, yeah, the, the worms always freak people out. It manages to freak everyone out, the larva. That get, no one wants to have stuff crawling through their bodies, right? So, that's the hive demon. Oh, yeah, look at this picture. Like you had a question about if two queens met, Jayla. Oh, yeah, I did. Hold on. I like that picture. This little person. See, that's a hatchling chasing was, down a person to in inject like, him. Okay, so I have several questions. There was one, like, if another queen was born, would the queen 
try to kill that queen so, so she wouldn't have competition. So maybe it depends on what the DM wants to do. Because if a new queen is born, they typically go off on their own or they'll start their own colony, right? Yes. They move away. Um, they do not join the other queen. Yes. Now, since this is inspired by aliens, you know, there's a series of comic books, aliens. And one of the series was called Hive Wars, where there were multiple queens battling for supremacy. So it's it's possible that that you could have multiple queens duking it out for supremacy. I would hate to get stuck in the middle of that. That would suck for everybody. Yes. Yeah. Because the high demons tend to just destroy everything they come across, so it's not it's not a good scene. It's not a good scene. Nope. So, uh, what was your other question? My other question was, um, well, that was like the first one. If she would try to um, kill the new queen, so she wouldn't have competition. The other one was like, what would happen if like multiple like they all went to war, basically? Yeah, they would they would try to just savage one another until only one colony was left. And then. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that would suck. And not to mention, like, you know, you said before that there's no really stopping him until you get to the queen. Yeah, yeah. So that was another aspect of him is that uh, this hive mind, most of the, the queen has the ability to see through the eyes of all of her brood. And she can actually, she's a very powerful and potent spellcaster, and she can actually cast spells through her brood. The brood itself has very little intelligence of itself. And and if you kill the queen, all of them suddenly just go inert. So when we play tested this, the people that survived, they took the, they charged into the hive and did everything they could do to get to the queen quickly. And while one line of, of party members was holding off just swarms of these things, the rest of the party went to kill the queen. So it was a very, very desperate fight from the beginning. Someone made a great use of Augusta Wind spell. That's you, Kristoff. It was per it was spot on. It was great. Yeah. But um yeah, it was it's it's every time I've play tested these things, it has been a, a, an epic desperate fight at the end. Do you think that um the queen is smart enough to have allies? Or do you think she just Well, there's that's actually in the the flavor text there for the high demons. They they will not serve anyone. And those that have tried to subjugate the queens, because there's no subjugating the brood because they serve the queen, and the queen is their intelligence, they've tried to subdue queens and they've tried to use them, but it just doesn't work. They just won't. They won't go for it. They won't buy it. No. So. Yes. There's another fallen angel that you wanted to talk about, Jalen. So there are two fallen angels in this, this book. One is the Hamingga, who's still good. Who is still good. And then there's the Abaddon. So we had talked about the Blood Wars a second ago. Yes. And then the Blood Wars, angels, demons, devils, they meet in battle. And they do battle. And sometimes the Dukes of Hell capture, manage to capture an angel... And that's when the bad things start happening. So what they do is they begin to torture this angel. And they strip this angel of all sense of who they were in, in, well, when they served Elysium or the Seven Heavens or the Divine Gods. And then they insert them into mortal society, typically into aristocratic society. They use magic to weave the illusion that this person belongs. And they are... In every sense of the word, a very stuffy aristocrat. And they always seem, you know, if you were ever to ask their neighbors or whoever, you know, the socialites, oh, yeah, I, I know them. They're, they can never name specifics, but the Dukes of Hell are very careful to weave the magic in such a way that they're, they're unquestioned. Yes, this person belongs here. And the curse of the Abaddon, while it may seem like a curse on mortals, because what happens is, is once a month, the Abaddon is driven to murder a mortal and drink her blood or drink their blood and devour their flesh. And that is certainly a crappy way to go for a mortal. But in the midst of this frenzy of this bloody, gory mess, the Abaddon suddenly 
remembers who they are. Like that glimmer of good comes back. And that's the true curse. That is what the Dukes of Hell are going for, is to torture this angel. So this angel, this, this you know, paramount of goodness, suddenly looks around and they're covered in the gore and, and waste of the poor mortal that they themselves murdered. And then as soon as they, they have that, that, that moment of clarity, then they that go. It's gone again, and they they return to their evil state. So the curse of the Abaddon is really about torturing the angel. Now, <clears throat> the uh, it poses a, a very important question. It's kind of like a it provides a monster that you can use in like a Jack the Ripper setting. You know, like the party has to investigate these murders, and they don't know who's responsible. But once they find out who is responsible, how do you deal with something like that? Do you try to lift the curse? Do you, um, you know, do you just go ahead and put them out of their misery? Uh, it's 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 it, it puts a a good aligned party in a bind, you know, because you want to help the angel, yeah. but at the same time you can't allow them to continue their their rampage, their murderous bends, um, and. You know, uh, Borg, in his description, he even says, of all the foes I have slain, his is the only death that still torments me. So even Borg was was strapped with this question, this burning question. How do we stop this person? What is the right thing to do? Is it, do we kill him? Do we imprison him? And if he doesn't, and here's the thing, if you imprison the Abaddon, and he's not allowed to fulfill his um, his murderous spree once a month. He his body is racked with pain, excruciating pain. And the longer he goes in between kills, the worse the pain is. So if you just imprison him, then you're you're you are guaranteed him to a lifetime of torment. So it's it's a very difficult decision to make for a good aligned party. And, uh, you know, I could see that the murder hobos rush in there and just beat his brains in. But, you know, this monster is not necessarily designed, I think, for the murder hobos to go have their fun with. You know, yeah. I feel so. like um, <clears throat> that if they do somehow manage to lift the curse, that they should either like it's I, I think it depends on the party. Either one, put him out of its misery so he doesn't, you know keep going or to make him try to make up for all of So even things. if you lift the curse, you'd think hmm, maybe he should still face judgment for these, these crimes. Well, I, I feel like if I was, uh, if I have killed thousands, thousands of people, I feel like I would want to die. Like I would just. And who knows, maybe an angel would. It comes down to the, what the DM wants the, the angel to believe what, what the DM uh, how the DM wants the angel to approach the situation if the curse man is managed to be broken. Or I feel like you should, um, they, the party, like I personally would have them uh, try to make up for their crimes. And atone. Like fight. Must atone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. What else you got, Jalen? Dice Attic Jalen? Let's see. I wanted to talk about this. The Pack Devil. Yes. Yes. So... Yeah, while we're talking about devils, I guess, let's talk about the pack devil. Yes. So the pack devil is one of these guys that, as a DM, I can't tell you how many times I've had players say things like, I wish my character just had a little bit more strength, or I wish this didn't happen, or I wish I had this cool item. And that's where this guy comes in. Because he's always listening. He's always watching. He's waiting for someone to get hit their, hit their bottom to step in. And they have the ability to shape change themselves into a more pleasing appearance. But the first step in any pack devil's plan is to become your friend, your best friend. He's always there for you. Once he realizes there's something you want, and then he starts worming his way in to the, to the back of your head, promising you goodies. Until finally... When you're at your weakest, he'll say, just sign on the dotted lines. Give me your soul, and I'll give you everything you want. And, you know, this is actually inspired by a monster that I used in my homebrew campaign, and I pulled it off. I got a player. 
I got a player to sign off, off their their character, their character's soul. And what was great was that the next campaign that we began, he made that character's descendant. And his whole mission was to restore the honor of his family and rescue his ancestor's soul from hell. Um, so it was great. It just it carried on to the next campaign, and it was beautifully done. It was great. So, Jalen, yes. what is it you wish you would have? No clue. No clue? It's a good place to be. No. Good place to be. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll rule the world. So, you, you want to rule the world? He can help you. The pack devil can help you. Rule the world and then suffer and death. And then he, but you got to sign your soul over. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Suffer and death. Yeah. Okay, so there's a monster I want to talk about real quick. And it's this guy. The Spell Ooze. Now, the Spell Ooze is a creature that um, we we got we kind of fell in love with oozes in the book. I think there's three or four different oozes or creatures that interact with oozes. And the Spell Ooze is one that is created through magical means accidentally. And... No, that's the bilge bone. That's a different kind of ooze. I have no idea where it is. So, but if you attack a spell ooze, they they have collected all this transmutation, arcane energy over time. And if you attack them, it releases. So if a guy runs up with a sword and hits him, his arms might turn into tentacles. Or his hands and feet might change places for 24 hours. Or he might turn into another random humanoid. Um, so all these weird things. And then it can start unleashing arcane energy as attacks as well. So that's its defense mechanism. You hit it, there's this big chart you roll on, and you can suddenly start sweating slimes and toads profusely. Or maybe all the hair on your body grows at the rate of one foot per minute. Something like that. Most of the effects only last 24 hours, but it was pretty. It was a lot of fun. The Critical Dice folks just did a review on the Monsters Lexicon, and that was one of their favorite monsters as well. So I had to mention it because it was good. Yes. So the Monsters Lexicon right now is available on Amazon in both paperback and hardcover. I think it's 10% off in each right now as well. The um, You can go on Amazon and search for Monsters Lexicon, or you can go to www.thepickledragon.com. <coughs> dot com, excuse me, dot com, and there's links to the Monsters Lexicon there as well. You can also find us, the Pickle Dragon, on Patreon, where I provide 5e content every month, monsters and NPCs and magic items and all whatnots. Um, so check us out there, Dice Addict Jalen. Pretty soon, we're going to have a special guest coming in, TPK, TPK Eric. We'll be talking about, and I don't know when it's going to be yet, maybe a couple weeks. We'll be talking about Days of Blight, an adventure inspired by the Salem Witch Trials that I wrote. I, I love that one. You love that one? Yeah. Well, that's coming up, too. So, Dice Addict Jalen, yes. you got anything else to say to the good folks? Give me your dice. Give me your dice. <laughs> You Give her your dice. Yes. Send them her way, or else she'll torment me. All right, guys. Thank you all. Happy gaming. Oh, and uh, if you haven't yet, check out Tim Cask, the curmudgeon in the cellar. His his um, YouTube channel is great. I love listening to his words of wisdom. Tim Cask, curmudgeon in the cellar. Check him out. Goodbye, all.